Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Queen of the Con. I'm so excited to be here. I'm just going to start with acknowledgement of country. So today we're on Gadigal land and as we gather to share stories and knowledge, let us reflect on the rich history of storytelling in this place. I pay my respects to elders past, present and any First Nations people in the audience today. Uh, so some practical details, if you could switch your phones to silent, um, particularly because if they go off and you've got a really embarrassing, you know, spoonful of sugar or something. Um, so phones on silent and in the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, uh, leave through the front door on my right. My right, that right. Uh, and if you're here with friends, you could use them as a human shield. So. Okay, so. Queen of the Con, so I'm here with uh, renowned Sydney Morning Herald journalist Kate McClymont and 60 Minutes journalist Tom Steinford. Are you renowned as well, Tom? No, no, oh. I write off I'm renowned for writing off Kate's coattails. Oh, very funny, very funny, very I, funny. Yeah. And so I just, I, I don't like a long introduction because I think everyone in the audience just goes, overachievers. So I've just gone with um, Kate's one, is it nine Walkleys, Kate? It's fantastic. And Tom travelled with Trump on the campaign trail. No Walkleys though. So this, this is again, riding on well, I wanted to try and hide that, but you've just <laughs> told kind. everyone. So nine Walkleys and no Walkleys. I just should have led with that, shouldn't yeah, I? Having said that, I am old enough to be Tom's mother. There's, there's time. There's time. I think we're all old enough to be Tom's mother. <laughs> Um, so me too. Um, so, and together, Tom and Kate made the extraordinary podcast, Liar Liar, Melissa Caddick and the Missing Millions. Sounds like an Enid Blyton story, doesn't it? Um, if it wasn't, except there's a foot. Uh, so in today's panel, we're going to talk about the case that took Sydney by storm. And for Melbourne folk like me, who do not know the real estate prices of Dover Heights, because we never heard of Dover Heights, um, we were just left gasping at the horror of a washed up foot. But more about that later. Uh, Tom, I just thought I couldn't start without going, Trump, did you get to meet him and, and describe him and, you know, if you feel free to use the word nutbag? Uh, no, I didn't get to meet him. I, the closest I got was about a metre or two, so I really could have saved the world there at one point if I acted decisively in 2016. Um, yeah, sum him up in one word, orange. Um, luminous orange, uh, a lot of makeup. Um, fascinating, though, to have been there. Certainly witnessing history, whether you think it's good, bad or, or indifferent. Wow, what a time. What a time that was. Well, you just left kind of like going, what the actual heck? Well, no, because this was, I was on the campaign trail uh, with him for three month, uh, three weeks prior to uh, when he won the election. And at that stage in Australia, I think he was still seen as a joke. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, the crazy guy off The Apprentice is, is running for president. That's 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 a lol. And um, but it's going to all of I went to his events and Hillary's and he had 10 times as many followers at all of his campaign events to Hillary. And I was just trying to convey to people back home. No, no this is a thing. This, this is happening. You know, I know you don't think it's serious. But this guy's a red hot chance of winning and lo and behold he did goodness me um that yeah just amazing so how did you two come to work together on uh liar liar did you kind of meet in a bar or you know <laughs> tell us about or the, the work canteen yeah. maybe <laughs> slightly less exotic than the bar the, the, the bistro bar, less, yes the, the bistro at um at uh at our new premises at nine and of course i'd done it for the herald and Tom had done done the story for 60 minutes. So we just thought it was a good idea to collaborate. And I was um, saying to Vicky outside that um, I'd been offered some book deals and I just thought, oh, you know, I, I don't know whether I want to do a book on this. And it's interesting that the podcast took about as much time as writing a book. But, you know, a bestseller in Australia, you might get, you know, 30,000, 40,000 if it's a bestseller. We've had more than 4 million downloads of the podcast. Tom and I were just lamenting that we didn't make a single cent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. But Vicky, the podcast queen, is looking aghast at our... Do you know where the money is? Ponzi schemes. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Which leads me to, uh, for people like me and... Uh, no doubt most of the audience who don't fleece their friends. Tom, what is a Ponzi scheme? What on earth? Um, uh, look, and thank you all for coming as well. It's great to see so many people here and taking an interest. Um, look, a Ponzi scheme is 
it's a criminal enterprise effectively. But what you're doing is luring people into into an investment and they think they put their money in and that you tell them, oh, gee, look how much X, Y, Z are making. And there are people that do make money out of it. And it's in effect kind of like a pyramid scheme that if you get in early and get out early, you'll do okay. But there is no investment of any substance. So you put your money in, this person mingles it in a pot. And when someone says, can I have my money back with all those profits you told me about, which is exactly what happened with Melissa Caddick. She told people that they were making profits and when they call for their money back, she's got to give it to them. So they have to keep sourcing new investors to pay out those that are leaving the fund. Now, no Ponzi scheme ever ends with everyone shaking hands at the end and saying, wow, that was great for all of us. Eventually people are going to get screwed. And it's interesting in this case as to whether she thought somehow that she would gamble on the stock market, that it would all come right in the end. Because as Tom said, it's basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. And traditionally, you know, with people like Bernie Madoff, it comes to an end either when something happens and everyone wants to redeem their money. And in the case of Bernie Madoff, that was um, the 2008 global financial crisis. So his scheme had been going since 1991. And he fleeced, you know, more than $17 billion, billion dollars. And it was only when something happened and they all wanted their, people wanted their money back. And you can't get new investors. It's all contingent on finding fresh blood. Goodness. And of course, you have to have the skills, don't you? Like my brother's got something to do with stockbroking and he goes, oh, you should buy shares in this. And then by the time I get home, I've forgotten the tip. So you have to, you know, there's got to be some skill level except, involved, isn't except it? Except the, the thing about Melissa Caddick was that the scheme was actually really simple. Like she would say to people, um, I'm a financial advisor and, and look, I'm doing so well for myself. It is absolutely no problem for me to help you. I'm, I'm doing it anyway. So why don't you just give me your money? And then at the end of each month, it was literally, she copied and pasted the Comsec logo. And she obviously had a Comsec account herself, but she was so sloppy that um, Comsec account numbers have eight digits. She, she only had six. She squibbed even on the Commonwealth you know, the Comsec digits. But anyway, but just by sending each month to her investors, here are your four shares, look how well they've done. Like it was quite simple. It, and, and her skill was not finance, her skill was sales. Like she could say, you know, sell sand to the Egyptians kind of thing. Like it was convincing people that she would get them returns that no one else would. Now she did try and invest some of the money they gave her. She was terrible on the stock market. She was shocking with um with cryptocurrency she lost most of the time she invested she had a go but she was terrible at it but she was great at convincing people that she was the one that they should trust and the other thing that is really interesting is how people are willing to believe on what looks good as in so by the time she'd stolen money from a couple of pe- a couple of people um and she'd bought a house in dover heights she's living the life she's driving the car People see that and think, oh, she's doing well. So the fact that she's wearing all the designer labels, it then gives the appearance of wealth. I mean, it was all stolen money, but, you know, people didn't know that. So going right back to the start, Kate, you broke the story when you were chasing the AFP lead and there were some raids and little did you know that you kind of stepped into this whopper of a story. Tell us about that day. Look, as often happens, you fall upon stories completely by chance. And I was looking at an insider trader, alleged insider trader, because the, the, it didn't go anywhere. And his house was um, raided by the federal police and by ASIC. And I rang up ASIC, who never help you with anything. So I rang up the federal police and they said, oh, Yes, yes. Now, hold on. Do you mean the raids on the house in Wallaroy Road or the raids on the house in Wallangra Road? And I said, oh, who, who's, who's well, a Wallangra? One of each, please. Yes. yes. <laughs> and um, when they said, oh, it's, um, it's a Melissa Caddick from Dover Heights. Well, being of a suspicious mind, I think they're having an affair. I think my insider trader is dating 
Melissa, but it it um it didn't happen. So look, I I had started to do the preliminary things of doing ASIC searches, seeing what she had, and then she disappeared. Then it became a story. I feel like um with the two of you in the podcast that you had so much fun doing the podcast. And I think by about episode five, there was just this constant horrified delight in the excesses. And I think Tom, by the last episode, I think you even said a red word. I did, yes. I think it probably, Kate, Kate shed a tear in the last I, episode. I, I, I cried. She cried for week. the victims and I, I think I called Anthony a dickhead. So, um, you know, that's maybe you gauge something from that. No, I mean, it was a lot of fun. And to work with Kate, who is just an, encyc we had fun. an yep. encyclopedia on legs and, and knows everything, you know, you'd be mentioning this road and shows, oh, yeah, I remember back in 1979 that there was a, an investigation into the road and you're just like, what the hell, where did this come from? And Kate is just such an amazing source of insight and intellect and it's great to feed off that uh, when, you're, when you're working on a project. Um, I think part of the horror, and this is, I guess, this uh, we were talking before about true crime often and crime fiction has this laughter and tears. And I think part of the horror that, that from a listener's point of view was what she did to her own family. Um, so, it, it, and this is, I guess, different because the, that Ponzi scheme that you're talking about before, I'm guessing that that's just really broad. But these, the people that she targeted, trusted her because they knew her. Kate, how, how much did that affect you when you're hearing these awful, awful stories of huge loss? Oh, look, they were really terrible because, um, you know, one of the people, her very first victim was her oldest friend from school and it was a woman called Kate Horn. She's a single mother. She's working night shift as a nurse to you know, look after her two children, to try to save money, to try to get ahead. Melissa knows this. And yet she's the first one that she targeted. She stole her life savings and then went on to target um, her, Kate's brother and her mother. And I think that was the saddest thing for me, was talking to Kate Horn's mother, who was, I think, 79. And she was saying, you know, you know, she wasn't even complaining. She just said, I've worked so hard all my life and now I've been left with nothing. And my children can't help me because they too have nothing. And she said, I now, you know, when I go to the supermarket, I think twice about whether I can afford my groceries. And she also said at night, I think about, you know, can I lash out and have a glass of wine? And you think, this is awful and you know i do feel sorry for melissa caddick's um, mother and father who were facing eviction because she's the money that they gave melissa supposedly to put into their apartment that they live in in edgecliff she spent on a diamond ring on jets but at the same time i think they all of the victims should be the same i don't think melissa caddick's parents should get special treatment when there are quite a few elderly people who are in the same dire predicament. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, and I mean, just on that idea of, you know, who she targeted, I mean, this is a crime of familiarity. It's the easiest crime because you don't, sus people don't suspect you of being up to no good. And, you know, she really lent into the fact that these were her friends and her family who every one of them say, oh, it's Melissa. Of course we trusted Melissa. And even like, and it made me think about myself, my brother's a financial planner and he looks after all of my financial affairs and he just sends me things and I say, yeah, cool, whatever, do do whatever you do. And all of a sudden, and it occurred to me, I'd, I'd never think to think that my brother's screwing me Did over. You check the ComSec numbers at this age? Yeah, I've, I've severed ties with my brother since then. And, uh, um, but that's exactly what it is, that you don't, never for a minute would you think your own brother, your own children in this instance would exploit you so and it's it's fascinating how the psychology of uh, of fraudsters like the original charles Pon ponzi and like melissa caddick and like bernie madoff are the same like all of them targeted people in their um th their friendship group or their um their communities but the other thing that they did was quite cleverly make themselves look exclusive. 
So for instance, you know, some people, you know, would be told about Melissa and she'd say, look, I'm really sorry, but I don't have an opening for you now. And then lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, an opening would appear. So people felt and she, she was, was doing, doing the favour. Favor. Exactly. I totally saw that yesterday, just walking through the streets of Sydney and there's some fancy pants shops and they would have like two people in them and then about six people waiting outside. You know, the shops that a scarf is $600. And I thought, oh my God, what assholes. You know, like that exclusivity. We are so exclusive that we'll treat our clients like, like we'll make them stand outside. Like it's- Is this so still it's COVID or is it a thing? No, no it it's was not. It's and oh, Chanel. <laughs> What have you been in the queue, Tom? <laughs> and I pr I pronounced it Hermes just because out of spite. Yeah. And and channel. Hermes and channel. That's just so rude. So that that what you're talking about is that if we have this air of exclusivity, then we'll can make we, people. Can we just wanna... confess to something? Have you got Tom, the scarf? No, Tom and I did have to go to look up Google to get the correct pronunciation. Of several especially, brands. Yeah, especially the uh, overseas ski labels. We had no idea. We, we sounded like we got it right though, didn't we? Did we? <laughs> Maybe. You, you said that really well, Tom. Um, just man. rolled off the, rolled oh, that, off the uh, yeah, Go for the watches, you're good at those. <laughs> go on. Cardia. I think that's where the, in the Tom. podcast there was so much fun in, 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 and I think both of you relating these hugely weird prices for blazers and watches and what was that car that um, Anthony had like a oh, the, the Audi Audi R eight four hundred thousand dollars worth of fight and fury but I mean but that was the tip of the iceberg I mean they're going on holidays for a hundred grand I mean if what I spend over a thousand dollars on a holiday I'm having conniptions and what about that one we found where she went to Fiji on that private island how much was it a night twelve thousand dollars no ten thousand ten thousand it's, it's, it's now, 10, it's now <laughs> sorry, ten thousand dollars a night and I think when she was going it might have been eight or something like that but it was sort of you know we're looking at these just you just can't quite imagine and which brings us a little bit back to Anthony because I just don't know how he never thought, wow, where is this money coming from? My wife's a genius compared to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm going to, I've got, um, I want to read out, and I, I apologise to people who love poetry, but, um, you know, who doesn't like poetry? The girl from Nantucket and the boy on the burning deck. But um, Anthony Coletti, uh, in an article that you wrote, Kate, um, he had a go at your podcast, which I thought was quite, you know, rude. Um, to make your cast look neat, to kick her son and I out on the street. You've got to give him points for rhyme, don't you? Uh, you left me with two bucks, but I landed back on my feet. And ends with now that he has zero rude F words to give. Oh, well, he sounds nice, doesn't except, he? Except he was singing it, which adds an extra horror <laughs> and and you know what really annoyed me was that um um in the song that he made about tom and i it was so sexist i'm kate the hag he's fabio tom <laughs> i mean really that is so unfair but no. tell us about your tell us about your ego tom oh it's the size of a postcode is that yeah, his, yeah. tom's ego was so big it has its own postcode no, according to like Anthony. Dover heights or <laughs> yes yes 20 20 or 30, I think it was. No, the, um, but you talk about his rhyming. Uh, you, you've glossed over his greatest rhyme, which was, we're sorry, Mr. Coletti, we're going to turn your wife's brain into spaghetti. <laughs> no, we're going to turn you into spaghetti. No, yeah, it was, it was Coletti spaghetti. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, he, modern Shakespeare, really. He's gifted. Gifted. I feel like he should stick to hairdressing, but that's just me being a little bit judgy. You know was he's he good on, at hairdressing? He's on air tasker. Oh, goodness. So go to Air Tasker, keep an eye out for Anthony. Um, we should do that. We should book him one day, just like a blind booking. He walks in and we're sitting there. Morning. <laughs> Look, I, I just love the way that um, Anthony is described in the press as Melissa Caddick's second husband, former hairdresser, DJ and part-time prawn farmer, which I feel like... 
I feel like he's just multi-talented, isn't he? A bit of side hustle in this day and age. Prawn you know. farmer. How do you even? Yes, farm he was. Prawns? Uh, he was breeding prawns in his home aquarium. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's good that he's breeding prawns because because if you know, with this kind of intellect, I was worried that he planted them and was waiting for them to grow. But <laughs> yeah, so it's good that they're in an aquarium and that they're in water. Um, so. Is the devil in the detail here? I know that we have to be really careful because in the podcast and as a writer, you, you can see the, the sidestepping because I can see that in, in it, and that you go, he's a dickhead, you know, but but all along, well, we, we don't know that he knew anything. We don't know that he knew about these excesses. We don't know that he thought that you should report someone missing straight away, not, you know, 30 hours later. It, do you have to be a little bit careful in the weave? Well, I would say that I, not to you know fully feel sorry for Andy, I genuinely don't think he knew that much. Melissa, I think, saw him as the useful idiot who'd just, you know, come along and follow him like she was the Pipe Piper. And I, I don't think... I, I do think, though, we had to be careful to not suggest that his um, his failure to report her was because he was involved either in her fraud or her disappearance. So you do have to be careful that you know people you know aren't left with that idea. And this comes back to the nature of their relationship, though. That you know we had this discussion about he probably was so uh, paralysed by not knowing what to do. You know, what will Melissa say if I go to police? that he thought twice about going and reporting her missing in the first place. So there's every chance that he did not report her missing because he thought Melissa will get annoyed if I do. So I'll just sit here and wait for instructions from her and they never came. <laughs> Kate disagrees with me. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I still think... But he did try. Tell, tell us about oh. uh, driving around the neighbourhood. So, okay just go back to the day in question so the police are at their dover heights house for more than 12 hours all the designer clothes all the handbags are paraded out before them and then he later says we went to bed as normal everything was fine you think everything was fine you must be kidding she disappears the next day he doesn't do anything her phone is there the car keys are on the table, and then that night, what does he do, Tom? Well, I think it's what any right-minded person would do. Um, he cut laps of the neighbourhood with his music blaring out the speakers and yelling. Oh no! Hoping that hoping. he's hoping that his beautiful lyrics, like the ones you just uh, read, would lure her out of hiding. It's like a siren song for bogans, isn't it? Oh. If I, honestly, if I had heard that, I would have just run. <laughs> I think anyway, we all would, so, Kate. I know, but the thing is, so, okay, that's that day. And then that takes us, so the, the raid of her house is on Wednesday. She's last, she's not even seen, her son hears the front door open and close at, I think, 5.30 a.m. No one actually saw her leave. And unfortunately, the CCTV equipment from her own house had been taken by the federal police in the raid. So there was nothing at their house to establish what time she left. And it's interesting that even though so many houses in that area have got CCTV equipment, the police were never able to find a single trace of her, of where she went. So, I mean, I think that adds to the mystery. So it's not, um, so she's gone all day Thursday. He's out looking for her Thursday night. And then it's not until Friday morning when she's meant to be in court. And because it's COVID, it's online. And we get the trans transcript from the court case. And there's Anthony saying, is my wife there? I mean, it was extraordinary. <laughs> And I, I love the way about him. when he talks about the AFP raid and part of his anger toward the AFP is that they just spent all of that time in his house enjoying the view for free. Oh, no, and his biggest complaint was um, he suggested they broke his um, 
zip water, you know, where you get zip your tap. Dis- zip tap, yeah, where you get your distilled water out of a tap. That was the thing he was most annoyed about was he accused them of damaging his tap. Your wife's missing, but your tap's damaged. That's bad. And I feel like if the AFP had a right to reply, they'd be going, we did not enjoy your view. Do you not know what we do when we raid? We're not just going, whoa, nice view. Like, I don't I don't think that's part of the job description, is it? I could be wrong. But um, he, he seemed to get angry at really weird things. Yeah, that that's our Anthony. Um, the, the whole, th- I mean, he's angry about everything. And... Uh, Again, in Anthony's defence, I mean, this is the rock of his life. Like he, he not only obviously the diamond of his life. There Tom. you go. <laughs> but you know, this is it, this was his financial dependence. Obviously, he was you know in love with her. He, he clearly felt very strongly about her. But so he's been cut adrift in that regard. So he is all at sea on numerous fronts. But again, you look at some of the things and think, well, yeah, really. As a crime writer, I've written about a lot of people who cannot take responsibility for their actions. And I feel like even though they weren't his actions, there's a lot of that there that he's kind of angry at the AFP for enjoying his view and breaking his tap and angry at all of the people who are coming for him. But I don't feel like there's any responsibility. Well, maybe did Melissa fleece all of our friends and family and maybe... I should be outraged about that. That it's it's very not where it should be, isn't it? It it appears that he cannot see further than the harm that's done to him. For instance, um, he tried to sue the liquidators, saying that he that he should get the house and that he should get a whole lot of other things, and he very bizarrely put in you know, or hand it over to the liquidators, look, here's my bank accounts. And this is why you can see that all the money I earned was going to Melissa. And the bank accounts were an absolute gift. Not only was he um, going to Slippery Little Sucker's bait shop, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, for his prawn breeding. I'd love that you could have a company called Slippery Little Suckers. But anyway, so there he is saying, um, here's, here's my money. But the bank account showed that mysteriously thousands of dollars were going into his account in cash and then almost immediately after he was going to hotels and drawing out $500 at a time. So he didn't ever explain where the money was coming from in the first place and he said he was withdrawing money to give it to Melissa. You think, well, you've just got $5,000 in cash in your bank account in the morning. Why are you paying um, ATM fees to withdraw it in $500 lots from hotels around the city? Don't know. Weird. He he could have been buying prawn food. (laughs) Well, why not take the cash and go to straight to Slippery Little Suckers? Indeed. There's so many mysteries here, isn't there? Um, Particularly, I'm fixated on the prawns. Um... So I'm also fascinated in his um, AK tattoo and his DJing and we we were lucky enough to hear some, well, I didn't really hear it, all I heard was kind of screaming, but I I think it's good if you're in that. You know, tell us about this. So he's just launched into this DJs that pours off or something very odd. Well, you've got to set the scene. I think a full disclosure as as kate said he's written a song about us two which i'm very flattered about but if for those that haven't heard anthony i thought it'd be worth you listening this no is- <laughs> watchdog entertainment nine media company with no spine fake news one-sided views that's the reason you're number two underbelly what belly you don't even have a spine you just can't even remember their lines so on and so forth. Um, so obviously that's number one on the ARIA charts. Um, but yeah, the the songs, the obsession with the AK-47, it's all, I don't know. Because he had a company called AK-7 Proprietary Limited. And of course, because his initials are AK, he is absolutely obsessed by the, the fact that it's the same as a, you know, Kalishnikov rifle. So he's got a lovely... Uh, rifle tattooed on his back 
And, and paws off, which is spelt like dog paws, is meant to be a play of you can't listen to music with the paws on. Clever. Mm, very clever. He's a gifted wordsmith, isn't he? Very gifted. Um, I think he also tried to get an agent as well, thinking maybe that he would get gigs out of this. Is did that? How did that work out for him? <laughs> you go. I'm the, oh no! Remember the um, the remember he entered into Triple J the yeah. Triple J competition, and he hadn't got any. Um, he hadn't got yes, any reviews. There, there's a, Triple J has a uh, a music um, uh, sort of. Battle of the Bands almost, called Unearthed, where um, young performers can sign up and try and get uh, national recognition. So Anthony, uh, in his late 40s, I believe, uh, signed up for the youth radio station's music <laughs> competition and hoping that this could be his big breakout moment and uh, registered on there, pause off, put up the music, proud as punch, left it. And he's obviously checking back every day to see, you know, or people, people vibing what I'm putting out there. And eight days later, not a single review. So finally, a user called Pause Off, Gave it five stars. <laughs> I don't know who that pause off person was, but no, gee, they were a big know. fan of his work. But even the thing was, like when you looked back and he'd, um, you know, he'd post all these things and he'd put things on Instagram, even Melissa, even his own wife never bothered giving it a tick or great work. <laughs> <laughs> so she seemed totally disinterested in his musical career. She was happy to give him money to buy the equipment, but then it was like, don't ever tell me about it ever again. This is what I mean by the useful toy boy, though, that, that he was the just, you know, bit of arm candy for her and, you know, looked nice and, and whatever. But I haven't got a lot of time for the rest of whatever you're up to. Here's some money. Look pretty. Thanks for coming. Indeed. And I don't even think he looked pretty, so he kind of failed on that. Um, <laughs> so when when you're looking at this case and following the money, how hard is that? Because... It seemed was it twenty three million in the end? You know, twenty three million is a lot of a lot of money. And how does that all vanish? Does it all vanish? How hard is it? I mean, we know the holidays are non refundable. You can't get that money back. But how much? You know, how hard is it to follow that money trail to kind of figure out what's left? Well, following the money is is difficult. But for the liquidators who were appointed by the court to, you know, collect all the property and things like that, they had access to her bank accounts and those documents were tendered in court. So it was absolutely fascinating because they listed her spending and she was spending half a million dollars each and every year on travel alone, half a million dollars. And then there was the, the Chanel, the Dior, you know, $52,000 just at one shoe shop. I mean, that's a Two, lot 230 of grand at Christian Dior. Like, I, I just, the oh, mind I boggles on what you actually get. And in fact, that. there was one photo that we had, which was Melissa and Anthony going to a ball at um, the private school where her son was attending. And it was in the, the junior school gymnasium. So you can pan through and you can see what other people were wearing. There is Melissa. She has, well, she and Anthony have got about $450,000 worth of, you know, uh, jewellery, clothing, handbags, just for a night, a school day night at the junior school gymnasium. I mean, the Oscar de la Renta dress was $14,000. She had a piece of jewellery, $250,000, and it's all stolen. And you sort of wonder, I, I'm fascinated to know what the other parents made of Melissa and Anthony at school. And what was interesting was that she never really targeted the other parents at the school, did she? And you sort of wonder whether that was because she stuck to the people that she knew who wouldn't ask too many questions. Um, you know, maybe she thought that school parents, you know, if they're able to afford school fees, then maybe they have some business acumen. <laughs> and here's the irony, because I was a school teacher for 31 years until this year. Thank you. I'm not, oh, I'm not well doing done. it anymore. Um, but what happened, you know, I worked in some really lovely private schools and the people that were 
the the wealthiest and and you know they dressed right down so i'm thinking because now i'm embarrassed for both of them because i'm thinking all the parents who were at, had legitimate wealth would have been looking at her going oh my god you're such a faker they would have judged her i think you're probably right but there there was one person from her school um did get caught up with it but it wasn't through school so they're skiing in aspen and they're across the corridor and um you know they get chatting their sons are at the same school and so she says to this um you know woman oh i own my apartment well she didn't that was a lie but um and then she explained that um you know she was a financial advisor and you know look i'd, I'd love to help you but of course I, I just don't have any capacity at the moment so when they get back to sydney voila a spot becomes available so the other person um the woman gave her a million dollars and within the first four weeks you know melissa had made like a you know 20 percent return on it so she hands over 2.5 million all up so and then of all the bizarre things like you just cannot make this up so in august we're in lockdown she goes to have root canal treatment of all the fabulous things you can go and do goes into the city and the city is completely empty so she gets talking to the only other person in the waiting room who says you know they talk about how COVID's hit and how you know quiet it is and the other person said look i'm lucky that i've been able to <clears throat> excuse me run my financial services business from home during the lockdown normally i work in the city and the other woman says oh well you know my financial advisor she's got a great home office set up in dover heights and the other patient says please tell me it's not melissa caddick and the other woman says yes and she said i i can't talk to you now but you need to talk to me urgently so gave her a card and that afternoon <laughs> so that afternoon they catch up and the woman says she has stolen my financial services license i have reported her to asic you need to get your money out as soon as possible so the very next day she says to melissa i found a house i need the money can you please give it back and of course melissa tries to talk her out of it and this bit i absolutely love she sent an email you know begrudgingly giving her money back and then said what about your brother <laughs> you know so straight on to the next person so the authorities get involved and they raid the house and they enjoy the view and then break the tap break the tap they're busy aren't they um and so melissa disappears and then we have this train wreck of victims and horror and then so for out of towners uh who were kind of following this in the news we get the foot talk to us about the foot we were at this stages of the early uh incarnation of the podcast we were just about to start recording it and the foot washed up and we went well that's it the podcast. no story podcast's cool she's dead case closed and lo and behold i mean the foot is almost the the beginning of the story now like it, that's from there is where it's re really gone crazy we thought that was the end but that was just the beginning but yeah the, the foot washed up on this bizarrely remote beach and so far from sydney and you know you think of something drifting in the ocean it might turn up three beaches down or whatever this is months and months on six hours drive away on the remote stretch of beach that melissa used to camp on as a child like of all the beaches in new south wales for this to wash up on it's where she used to camp as a kid so all of a sudden you're going hang on is there more to this what's and going on can i just um inter interlude here for a moment to say that i had a very interesting package arrive at my office recently and it looked so suspicious that the front desk had to open it it turns out to be a shoe mounted on a plinth and it was called the melissa and it was the prize for the best beach find at Bermagui beach control during the season so 
the person who sent it to me had in a card, my boss said, we cannot award this, it's too distasteful. But at, at Bermagui Beach, we were so upset that the, the foot sailed right past us and washed up at Bonda. So the best thing we could do was to make our own <laughs> award, but we're not allowed to do it because it's too distasteful. So we thought, who is the one person who might appreciate that? Yes, <laughs> it's on my desk and I love it. Just when you think this story can't get any, you know, you've got DJ, you've got Melissa, you've got a foot and now you've got Beach Envy. It's just, it never ends, does it? Um, just before we go to questions in the audience, um, how much money do you feel might come back? We heard these stories of of these people that lost everything. How much do you reckon in the 23 Look, it, million? It, what are we looking at? Much of it depends on the sale of the house in Dover Heights. So they've already sold the cars. What did the cars fetch? Oh, two or three hundred grand or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, in fact, they did quite well considering yeah. they were secondhand cars. But so Anthony told the court that um, the house was worth at least 15 to 17 million. But it seems like that is really rather ambitious. She bought it in 2014 for 6.2 million. And our lovely. Um, uh, property reporter Lucy Mackin found out that she'd been sold a pup and that it was in fact she paid way over the value for it. So if they get 10 million, they might, I think that would be probably maximum. And you don't know whether being the house where something um, rather dreadful happened, whether that's actually going to dampen or raise the value i'm not sure and then but, there's the parents well but there's also a bit of a delicious irony here in that anthony has spent two years fighting tooth and nail that this is my house i'm not leaving get stuffed and eventually he's been rightfully sent packing but if you follow property prices for two years during COVID, they went up 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 and right at the point that anthony got flicked they've gone through the floor so anthony stuffing around has probably cost investors another two million dollars just because he refused to get out of the house and also um the parents um who live in the edgecliff property she bought that for i think 2.5 million and don't forget both properties had large mortgages on them so they're not going to get that money clear and the parents are claiming that they should have a right to live in that property for the rest of their life and have a third equity. But as I said before, their million dollars didn't go anywhere near the house. It was used to buy jewellery and jets, like they're in the same position. But that is still going through the courts. So it'll be interesting as to what they get. And I don't know when the auction of all the goods are going to be, you know, the handbags and the clothes. Um, so look, I, I just think if I think maybe if they get 30, 30 cents in the dollar, that would be good. They might get more, they might get, it'd it? be something, yeah. All right, we're gonna throw to audience questions. Okay, so we know there's been a foot and it landed on the beach where uh, Melissa spent her childhood holidays. So where's the rest of Melissa? Do you believe she's still alive somewhere and she just cut off her foot? and threw it off a boat somewhere on the way to her little private island that she bought at some point. <laughs> you so you all laugh, but <laughs> no, I mean, I think Kate and I probably share an opinion that I, I don't believe that Melissa Caddick is still alive, but you say that to her victims and they're like, oh no, you don't know Melissa like we do. You don't know Melissa. She would cut off her foot and she'd throw it over the edge in an instant. But, and then I sort of go into my, you know, trying to devil's advocate everything. And you think the idea that someone would cut off their foot and throw it out to sea just to put people off the scent is so ridiculous that it is inconceivable. But then rorting your parents out of millions of dollars, rorting your brother out of millions of dollars, stealing tens of millions from your closest friends. That is also completely inconceivable to me. So if you're capable of one, who's to say you're not capable of the other? But I still think she's dead. 
And on Monday, the inquest starts. And so um, that should provide, hopefully, just some, some analysis so by a forensic pathologist to say, we still don't know how much of her foot was in the shoe. We don't know whether there's any bone fragments that you can actually tell whether it was severed or not. They've kept that really, really quiet. So we're hoping that next week we might get some answers to that. But I, I personally think that she jumped off. And I sort of think, why would you cut your foot off when you could walk up to the cliff, leave a note, leave your car keys, leave your phone, I, I can't go on, and then disappear? I don't know why you would need to, um, unless the foot's been in Anthony's porn breeding aquarium, you know, gathering some uh, oh, algae. I I don't think we've looked into prawns enough because I just had the thought that when he had to be evicted from the house, did he leave prawns in the curtain rods? Because that's a thing. I, I don't know. Oh, Vicky, no wonder you're a crime writer. <laughs> I know. I just think the worst. I can't help it. Uh, we've got uh, – oh, are you doing – yep. Going back to what Vicky was saying before about kind of skirting as far as you can go in terms of defo law in New South Wales – one of the things I did note was you talked about how at the first press conference, while the Grimleys, Melissa's family, including a brother, Adam, who had invested and come back to kind of sort everything out, were in tears absolutely to pieces. Anthony Coletti seemed to be very calm and also pretty lackadaisical when he turned up at the family home um, for a Christmas dinner a few weeks later. I just wonder what your theories might be as to you know, given how, um, I guess, reactive and emotional he's been since, why he seemed so calm at the press conference and at lunch. And did Melissa have any life insurance? Which one do you want to answer? You open the batting and I'll, uh, I'll go oh, second. Well, just to, to the insurance, yes, she did have insurance. She did have a lot of life insurance. And that is also going to be at an issue because anyone here who knows anything about uh, insurance companies, they will fight tooth and nail not to have paid out. And also she would have uh, made fraudulent statements in in actually taking out the life insurance. But that's something that um, is yet to come. And it's interesting about the press conference. You, you talk about um, Anthony at the press conference. Well, yeah, you're right. Our lawyers uh, certainly took a keen interest on that part of the podcast and uh, had a bit of input on how it was um, framed. Um, look, I, again, come at it from the prospect of, I, I think Anthony was just a bit overwhelmed at the time. I, I spoke to the police officers who encouraged him to do that and he did not want to do it. He did not want to do it. They had, had to spend a week convincing him to make that public appeal. And I, I think the family had a much more forthright and um, certainly a, a more keen attitude towards being involved. And Anthony was dragged kicking and screaming to that. But in terms of his emotion, I mean, you can tell from when he's speaking there, he thinks she's still alive. He makes a very clear pitch to Melissa that, you know, you're not in trouble everything's looked after just come home and it's going to be okay and sort of for everyone's listening especially those that didn't know much about the case they just thought it was a missing you know some rich woman's gone missing and as soon as he says you're not in trouble everyone's alarm goes ding 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 she's in trouble like it's just it was truly bizarre and one thing that did fascinate us was that um, um it was melissa's brother Adam's birthday in early December. So she's only been missing for, you know, three weeks. And one of the people who was at the birthday party, so there's only family and a couple, a handful of friends saying they are all distraught and weeping, except for Anthony and except for the teenage son. So it's hard to say that they knew or, you know, you, you can't judge people by their reactions you look at lindy chamberlain so but they thought it was odd but you know they could have cried every single other day i mean you just don't know and you also you look at it through the lens of I, at the time i thought it was weird and they might have been in, in on something but that was on the proviso that she said to them hey look don't worry i'm going to go hide in the bahamas and come and meet me in two months or whatever but clearly she's gone and oh, not 
clearly, but 99% chance she's gone and taken her life that night. So they're not in on it. You know, looking back at it now with the, with everything we know now, I think they just genuinely were shocked, but genuinely thought she was coming home at some point. And you do have to feel sorry for the, the teenage son. I just think, you know, he has the same name as his mother. And you think not only is she on everyone's lips as a con artist, she's your mum and she chose possibly to kill herself and you've been left behind. It's I just think that's heartbreaking. I think in, in as much as we can make light about a lot of this, there, there is a lot of heartbreak, isn't there? And I think that's what made the podcast so compelling is because you've got this mix of heartbreak but then almost incredulity at the excesses and at the weird prawns. <laughs> Uh, Kate, you just touched on the uh, the son. That's what I was going to ask about. Um, we know that he's got a father over in England, but the, no, the, the father, father lives um, here in Sydney. Okay, and I mean, it's that's I think the saddest thing about this is that son, one way or another, has been left by his mum. Uh, is he okay? Is he, look, is he's, look, is we don't know, Anthony? and we deliberately tried to keep him out as much as we yeah. could of the podcast you know we've never used his name um no i would also you say we don't know we made a point of not trying to know like it, it, his business is none of our business and it's it, he oh, is speak for yourself <laughs> 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 um it, no but also the, the interesting thing was melissa so poisoned her family and her son about what happened with her first husband, also called yeah. um, Tony, that you know, from what we can gather, it's just been um, a very tricky relationship for the son to have with his father because Melissa was always in his ear, just lying, saying all these dreadful things that just didn't happen. So we sort of left with Tony Coletti as a pseudo father. Yes, I, I think that they happily play video games together in their new apartment in Four Clues. Okay. Yeah. What a dad. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, you feel, look, and I, that is one thing I genuinely think that Anthony Coletti absolutely loves his stepson. I really, um, and, you know, cares about him a lot. It does make me wonder whether she has disappeared with Anthony number three. <laughs> Who's a foot surgeon? Oh, look, I, I must say that I hadn't thought of this, but um, one of our keen podcast listeners pointed out that um, she had fleeced a group of surgeons in Perth. So it's quite obvious that one of them cut off her foot for her. That's what I hadn't I thought, thought of that, but... And my other favourite one was when a person um, contacted us and said, I'm a little bit psychic. And I love it when you're just a little bit psychic. But the little bit psychic person thinks that Melissa has had a sex change and she's hopping around in one, on one leg in the Greek islands. Was that autocorrect on their phone? Went from psycho to psychic? Is it? <laughs> Very funny. Hi. Uh, thank you for the story. It's an amazing story. I'm very interested in uh, when you covered the conversation in the dentist waiting room that the lady who knew that Melissa was using her financial services license and presumably she'd spoken to ASIC about this but nothing seemed to have been made public and the Melissa's clients didn't know um, what's your opinion on how much more of this story can go on as to the role that ASIC plays in this kind of whole sphere of financial advice and, and all those sorts of things? Well, one of the things that we were really interested in was that in November 2019, before, you know, so this is a year before Melissa goes missing, someone contacts ASIC and dobs her in, but it's anonymous. So it's not until June the following year, and we think it's the woman in the dentist 
who's done probably both complaints. But the next time round, it's not anonymous. The person gives their name, but in in between the first um, report and the second one, she stole more than seven million dollars. So, look, you know, in some ways, it's easy to say why didn't they do something, but then you know, I suppose like a lot of organisations, you're understaffed, you get, I think they were saying like 10,000 reports a month. So shifting them all, and I suppose if you've got an anonymous, um, you know, call, it makes it harder. Where do you go with that? It, it's That's a bit of a theme, isn't it, with all of the early stuff that the fake CV and that it's not checked. And I think I've interviewed a lot of people who've been fleeced or duped by offenders and it often strikes me that we are not designed to disbelieve. I am, you are, like journalists are and crime writers are, but most people are not designed to disbelieve. If we see a CV, we're not going to go, did you really go to Sydney Uni or did you really have that degree? And this seems to be this feature in this case that she walks through life and looks the part and has, you know, the CV that, that looks the part, but n no one's kind of going, are you? But actually one interesting thing too is the amount of times when she could have been reported and her bosses decided it was either too much trouble or too embarrassing for a corporate look. Like, you know, one of the first ones was when she was em employed at a fairly new investment house and it's really just her and the boss. So there's discrepancies in the invoices and it turns out she'd been forging his signature and writing checks. So he confronts her, she fesses up and he says, well, you know, you can leave now or I'll report you. So she just packs up the designer bag and she's out the door but nothing happened. Like you sort of think if she'd been reported right then, none of this probably would have happened later unless she'd moved somewhere else and changed her name. Because if you've got a record, it's much harder to do this. So many wasted opportunities, wasn't it? So the inquest, are you both covering it? Is there gonna be season two, the inquest? Uh, well, this time we need to figure out how to actually get paid for a podcast. So maybe if we can do that, there'll be a season two. No, we, um, yes, the uh, the inquest begins next week. Uh, are we there, Kate? I think you'll be there. And there will be a... And anyone can come. If you're not doing anything. No, I'm serious. It's open to the public. If you're not doing anything, uh, Lidcombe uh, Coroner's Court, Monday morning, be there. And yes, there will be a, a follow up in the podcast. So if you are already subscribed to the podcast, this will turn up in your feed not too shortly. Excellent. Well, I for one will be listening with great um, with with great enthusiasm because you two together make a great podcasting team. <laughs> I said before, if their day jobs, you know, that sixty minutes thing and that Herald, yeah, if that doesn't work out, they could be really famous podcasters. <laughs> Um, I'd like you to put your hands together for Kate and Tom. And thank you, Vicky. My pleasure. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you all for coming.